sitting down. Hi. Hello, hello. He's Frankie. Uh, say hello to Noni, everybody. Hi, Hi Noni and Frankie. Noni and Frankie. Introduce, Hi. introduce okay. yourselves. Well, you guys go first. Do I want to select always show the screen sharing? Yes, I do. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. We, we, yeah, let's start. Um, a, a few other people will join us. Um, so we have Australia, we have England, we have New Zealand, and we have me. Um, <clears throat> so uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. It's 6 a.m. in New York. I would not be uh, this chipper for anybody other than you guys. Mm -hmm. So uh, we appreciate well, it. <laughs> oh, you guys have been great. I, I appreciate all of you. Um, so introduce yourselves, guys. Start with you in Australia. Me? Okay. Hi. I'm. Uh, my name is Frankie J. Holden, but you can call me Frank or Frankie. And uh, I play Roy in a place to call home. How are you? Good day. And I'm Noni, and I play Elizabeth Bly, or Goddard, as I am now, Lizzie. And uh, I'm here with Frankie uh, in, near where he lives in Marimbula in New South Wales. Um, I came down today. I'm going to do a couple of performances of my one woman show, Mother, because he's trying to raise money to build a new theatre company, a new theatre <laughs> building, in fact. A theatre. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's why we, we've, we're together. Normally we wouldn't speak, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Frankie, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, people in Australia who love buying theatre tickets. Tell us a little bit about your theatre. So I live in a very small town. It's almost halfway between Sydney and Melbourne on the east coast of Australia. It's a beautiful part of the world. It's called the Sapphire Coast, but it is, it's remote. Uh, we're six hours from Sydney, six hours from Melbourne, and... I moved here 12 years ago, and as you do when you come to a small community, you get involved in the community, and uh, I've, been, I've gotten involved in a number of projects, and this is sort of the, the latest one, and the idea is to build a small theatre, 200 seat, uh, rake seating, and that will allow, uh, allow us to bring international stars like Noni and... Uh, and, and other performing arts companies uh, who, who tour around Australia uh, allow them to come to this area. But it will also be a facility for schools and uh, local universities, local drama groups, local dance troops, uh, uh, and other live performances to, uh, to, to use this facility. Because at the moment, there's really just a couple of you know, licensed clubs uh, which, which have rudimentary facilities, but nowhere really for the arts to be showcased uh, in, in, in a professional manner. So that's what we're doing. It's been a long gestation period. It's been in the pipeline for four or five years, but we're at the point end now where we're bringing people like Noni to town so that the locals can see the sort of theatre, the sort of performance that, that is possible if you have an appropriate venue. So it's, it's actually quite an exciting time, and, and Noni's been very, very kind and generous with her time and the, the whole town as you can imagine is is a buzz with excitement at uh because noni if you if, for those of you who aren't aware though well, you may be aware noni's uh an iconic figure in australian show business i have an iconic figure <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> but she she was awarded a lifetime achievement last year in our, our local what we call the logies which are the equivalent of your Emmys, and uh, she's had a, made a tremendous contribution uh, to theatre, film, and television, So, and she's really loved. And uh, so for her to take time out of her schedule and come down to this tiny little backwater, uh, it's just it's made everyone feel very, very special. So thank you. It's my pleasure. I can't wait. Um, you. Frankie, um, please keep us posted about the theater. Um, you know, what's going on? Do you have to raise money? You're selling tickets. Please, you know, keep in touch with us and let us know. Um, so, Noni, this is a chance to talk about Mother. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, when Seven Channel 7 here cancelled a place to call home at the end. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yep. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Um, at the end of season two, I thought I'm going to have to find some employment. So 
I spoke to a dear friend of mine, Matt Shelton, who's a director. Where, where is Matt? Have him come say hello. We love Matt. Matt. Say hello. Matt posts lovely post about you. There you go. And uh, Matt, uh, Matt is well known uh, to a wonderful Australian writer. Here he is. Hello. Hello, Matt. Hi, Matt. And we, we got together and talked to this lovely writer, Daniel Keane, and talked about some themes that we were interested in. Um, the primary one was judgment, how we live in such a judgmental society and how, you know, how we judge ourselves and that's very difficult to... Anyway, we said, look, Daniel, you go away and write something up as a proposal and we'll try and get you a grant to write this play. And 10 days later, he knocked on Matt's door and he'd written the play. And in 10 days? In hey, 10 days? In 10 mm. days. Unbelievable. Wow. And so I, we, toured, we organised a tour, Matt organised a tour regionally uh, through Victoria and Tasmania and New South Wales and Queensland, which I've done. And very, very good news is that we're going to be doing it in Sydney on a main stage in January, February. Uh, and that's the first capital city that we can do it in, so that's great. Um, how many seat theatre is in Sydney? It's about 350, something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah. So nice, it's like nice. Quite an intimate show, so it's ideal. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Kate. Hi, Kate. Yes. Say Hi. hello. Say hello Hi. to Frankie and Noni and talk away. Hey, Frankie. Hi, Noni. Hello. Where are you? We're in the UK. Uh, we're in Chester, so not far from Liverpool, Noni. Oh, right. I was there with my sons not very long ago. I took them to see Liverpool play. Yay. And, um, the right side. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and I went to England for the first time in my life, I'm ashamed to say, uh, last October and uh, took my wife and daughter and it's one of the best holidays we've ever had. We absolutely loved it. We were blessed with very good weather. We didn't get up to Liverpool. Uh, we did the south and the southwest and, and the Cotswolds and, uh, and all of that and it was just it was great and I'm definitely definitely coming back definitely do wales next time yeah we've got to do yeah. wales Love to go to token wales. welsh token welsh um yeah. have you guys uh, noni you were in the states weren't you you've been here i have been to the states very briefly yes but not for many years not for many many years this was the first time i had been to europe for 35 years <laughs> oh my goodness wow. I'm too busy being a single mum and working <laughs> uh, well I'm going to hopefully take the pilgrimage to Australia next year and uh, be able to see this country that has, you know, I never thought about Australia before I found you all. And now I'm like crazy about it. I read everything and I'm, I have a big Australian map on, uh, over my desk and, you know, quite a few of our fans have, have come to Australia only because of this show. That's so, amazing. uh, it, it really You'll is. never want to leave. <laughs> so, uh, it, it, have you been here, Katie? Yeah, my sister lives in Perth, but we lived in Brisbane in 2008 um, for 14 months. We loved it. We didn't want to come home, but immigration sent us home. Yeah, because um, I got poorly with, I got my first diagnosis with cancer in 2008 um, yeah. in Brisbane, so I had a lot of treatment over there. Um, but my mm. sister lives in Perth, so I've and it's been... made me want to emigrate there once Kate's passed. Yeah, so she's going to go back as a nurse, hopefully. So, but wow. uh, yeah, we've got a an affinity with uh, all things Aussie. Yeah, many memories there, and many happy times. And my nephew's there, who's ten, so we're yeah. regularly skyping with him as well. So it was hard yeah. last year. We were there in January, and we watched um, Brisbane play in the in the 2020 against Perth and we were sat in the Perth bit trying really hard not to cheer for Brisbane. <laughs> you got to be careful what you yeah. do and say in that situation. Yeah, that's right. It yeah. was really tough. <laughs> okay, so you guys you guys are real super fans. you got a captive audience here. You can ask Frankie and Oni anything you want. Yeah. Nearly anything. <laughs> okay. So um, what, one of the questions that we've got is... Um, Kate and I would love to sit and sort of have a couple of um, jars. jars with you and just look over the lake from where you live in the place to call home, Roy, or sit mm. and have dinner at the Blyes and kind of feel the tension at the dinner table. If you could choose somewhere that you would call home, for example, like home to us is Australia, somewhere relaxed and countryside, 
Where would you choose to be, or where would you choose to end your days with a great vision looking over? What an interesting question. Mm. It's a lovely question. Well, uh, you want me to go first? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would, I grew up, now we're all, seeing as we're speaking about Australia, I grew up in the northern part of Australia, in the Northern Territory, and uh, that's what they call the outback, and it's a romantic, mm -hmm, rugged part of Australia that even not many Australians go to. So uh, I, I'd like to say two things that if I, that's where I would like, that's what a place I would call home because when I go back to that part of the world, something really speaks to me. It speaks to my soul and it speaks to my heart. And uh, the Aboriginal people of Australia have a wonderful relationship with what they call country, which is the land. Uh, and they, you know, they have a, a it's a, a filial, it's a, it's a, uh, a matriarchal relationship with the land. And when you go to these parts of Australia, the remote parts of Australia, then you really do understand or begin to understand the relationship that they have with the land. So the, I, I'll, I'd say that, you know, the place that I would call home would be the top end, maybe looking, oh, maybe at the Darwin Sailing Club, having a barramundi with chips, looking out and watching the sunset over the Arafura Sea. And while I'm talking about that, if you'd like to, uh, particularly Susan, um, Google Outback Spirit, Outback Spirit, write that down. Okay. Outback Spirit, go onto their website and click on the videos and you'll see me giving you a tour of many of these really remote parts of Australia. They're fabulously beautiful. They're, 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 they're scenic grandeur, huge waterfalls, uh, rugged, rugged country. And, uh, and, and you guys as well, you poms. Uh, have a look on that, and then you'll see a different part of Australia. Outback be great spirit. We became yeah. fans of Gurumul where we lived in Oz. We lived with a great family that were very music orientated. So yep. we became fans of different alternative music. Um, yep. I was teaching there at the time, so I took my students and sort of introduced them to different cultures that they needed to understand about Australia. Um, so it's, it's a great place to think about looking at. Yeah, Outback Spirit, Outback Spirit Tours or Outback Spirit, you'll find it. And How about you, Novi? Well, I'm desperately trying to think where I would like to end my days. I, I find it really hard. <laughs> I'm, I'm being drawn to France at the moment. Um, I, I visited France as part of the trip with my sons and I've been, my, my idea of porn is looking at real estate in France. <laughs> <laughs> At least well, you can't get into trouble over that. That's right. Well, financially I might. Um, <laughs> but I'm very drawn to, I may actually go and spend some time there next year to do some writing. Um, but I, I, because I've always had such a sort of gypsy life, because of being an actor, you just sort of go where the work is. I don't really think of anywhere as home um, other than Australia in a general sense, um, where I live in the, the hinterland of the Gold Coast in Queensland. I have a beautiful acre there um, and that's that's home, but it's it doesn't feel like a spiritual home. But when I fly back into over Australia, uh, I do feel like I'm coming home. It does feel, it, it does feel like that's where I belong. And I, I had a chance to stay, live and work in England in the eighties. And I, I Thought, always thought I was English because my parents were English. I'm the only Australian born in, in my immediate family. And I thought I'd be going home to England to work and I couldn't wait to get home. Well, you know, it's interesting, interesting to mention that. As I said, I went to England for the first time ever in October last year mm. and I had a similar feeling. Mm. Um, and we are all, well, not all of us, but the vast majority of us are descended from English stock. Mm. And um, I felt... Um, I definitely felt at home, and I felt a spiritual, uh, a touchstone mm. uh, with, with England, isn't it? Do you find yeah. that interesting? Yeah, something? there's definitely past lives or something in there yeah. that resonate. But I also, I guess, wherever my sons are is home. Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's to me. Yeah. Um, speaking of geography, um, tell us a little bit about this fictional town of Inverness. Mm. Um, we know that it's a small town in the 50s, but 
tell us a little of the backstory. You know, with, who are the neighbors? What's the, is there a main street? Um, are people isolated? Do they come together in church? Do they, uh, you know, w- w- what's the town like? Well, it's, it's my domain. It was Elizabeth's <laughs> domain. It's my town. Um, very, very much like any little country town, I guess, anywhere. And that's why it has such universal appeal. Um, it is a class system, um, in, in certainly in Elizabeth Bly's mind it, it was. Mm. Um, and most of those country towns in those days were based on agricultural wealth. Mm. Um, it reminds me of, uh, A, the area in which it's shot, which is around Camden and Campbelltown, uh, just southwest of Sydney, what, was the, uh, the birthplace of the Australian merino industry. Mm-hmm. So Sheep. Uh, sheep. And uh, so uh, it generated incredible wealth for Australia uh, back in the 1800s. And similar to the mineral boom, the mining boom that, that this country's had over the last 25 years, uh, just, it was, it's, it's almost impossible to, to uh, fathom now how wealthy wool made Australia. Mm. And there's another area too known uh, which I've just had a visit to, which is the Western Districts of Victoria. Mm. So. You, what you have in, in places like Inverness is you have a rural environment, but also incredible wealth. And it's the the Blyes would be what we, nowadays, the Blyes would be old money. That is money mm-hmm. that was made probably even in the 50s. Mm. The, the Blyes' fortune and holdings and traditions were all set, probably set up 75 or, or maybe even 100 years before the show is set in the middle 1800s as opposed to the middle 1900s. So they are, uh, you know, they're the aristocracy. The squatocracy. Yeah, the squatocracy. Yeah. They're, they're the lord of the manor yeah. uh, in that area. And But at the same time, there's also nearly everybody else would be working class. And uh, this obviously is before uh, 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 much automation came to Australia. And Australia in those days was very much tugging the forelock to England. And you, so you see that we were we were a God fearing country. Oh, very much so. Church would have been the equivalent of today's shopping malls. Yeah, you know. <laughs> right, so, right. One thing that's missing, which I find interesting, in the show is there's no pub culture. Mm, no. Which of course would have been a very uh, important part of life. Yeah, we saw a bit of the pub with, with the Bert storyline, didn't we? Sarah going in. Oh, and, yes. right. Right. It's, you know. it's, it's, but most. However, it's, every bly that comes into the lounge has to go to the decanter and fill up a, yeah. a, a, in every shop. We've yes. noticed. Yes. Yes. To the pork. Yes. And speaking of that, I'll just. Uh, that order. <laughs> you can't yeah. be an Aussie and not have a drink in your hand. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a lot of drinking. Uh, uh, George, George drinks a lot. He, he drinks well, a lot. Is um, that it, George? Um, uh, uh, Frankie, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, about Roy. Um, tell us uh, when you got the part and you knew what what kind of backstory did you come up with for uh, for this charming rough guy? Well, did you, did you have to screen test? Did you have to audition? Yeah. Well, yes and no. So I was actually, you know, where I was. I was in the in the top end. I was uh, Australia, of, of Australia. Um, I was on a holiday with my family. We were in a, a place called the Bungled Bungles, which, as it sounds, was is miles from anywhere. And I got a phone call uh, from John Holmes, uh, who's a Channel Seven executive or was, and uh, he said, uh, "What are you doing?" And I said, "Well, I'm on holidays in the Bungled Bungles." And he said, "Can you get to Sydney?" Tomorrow, I said, no, not tomorrow, <laughs> but the next day. And um, he said, I've got something for you. So he, I, I had to, I had to test, but I was the last one that they tested. I think they were having trouble finding the right guy. And um, so I, I it was, a, I, I had the role. He told me I had the role, but he said, you've got to come down and put something on tape anyway. So, but it's a personal backstory for me. And, and, and it's one of the reasons why I love playing the role so much. My mum uh, grew up on a sheep property in, well, she was born in the early, mum's uh, passed on now, but let's, she would have been born in the mid-20s. And 
her mum and dad lived on a sheep property in an area of Australia called the New England Ranges. Uh, it's a rural area in, um, in the northwest of New South Wales. And, and I remember going there as a boy to, we'd go there for holidays. And so uh, mum's dad, I call Poppy, and mum's mum was Nan, they had a sheep property, and mum's brothers, my uncles, all had sheep properties as well, and there were three or four of them. So I can remember going out to that area on holidays, and we'd go there for three or four weeks at Christmas, and I, these uncles would taught me to ride, they taught me to shoot rabbits, they taught me to skin rabbits, they taught me to shear sheep, they taught me how to crack a whip, they taught me how to catch a snake, and they were- how to behave. (laughs) 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 They were gods to me, these men, because they, you know, at this time there were TV shows like The Cisco Kid and The Lone Ranger, and these guys could do the horse tricks that I would see the Lone Ranger doing or the Cisco Whip Kid. cracking. Whip cracking and, and riding, you know, running up and, and uh, mounting a horse from the rear. I don't mean that the way it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> How much wine? But you, but you know what I mean, don't you? You jump <laughs> over the back of the horse, then you're on the saddle, and then away yeah, yeah, you go. Yeah, anyway, these, yeah. these guys could, could do all those I'd things. I'd love to see George do that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, a little so, trampoline. <laughs> when this role was offered to me, I thought this is a wonderful opportunity to bring these men to life. Mm. And so it's it, it's it's a personal uh, it's personal to me from the point of view that I knew these guys, but also uh, on another level, it's uh, it's an it's a, a not a version but an aspect of Australian manhood or Australian maleness that is disappearing Uh, and some may say has disappeared Uh, and so I wanted to bring that, you know, the man from Snowy River, you guys are probably familiar with that um, aspect of Australiana and, you know, I thought it was a great opportunity to to bring that to a a contemporary audience. So every time that I'm... It keeps hmm? alive for people that don't know it. It makes people fall in love with that side of Australia they might never get to see. Yeah, so Roy's got, uh, you know, he's laconic, but he's got this, you know, he's very reliable, he's steadfast, he's, a, you know, he's, he's not really progressive in his attitudes, but he's um, he's not blinkered, he's not a bigot. If you can prove yourself, doesn't, uh, you know, you, you can be gay or you can be a black man. Or Jewish. Or Jewish. Uh, and Roy will have a natural, he will stand off. Because of his, uh, because of you know the ingrained, uh, well, racism. That's, that's part of, uh, he, yeah, but he's but if you prove yourself, then you're all right by Roy, and he will do anything for you. Mm. And um, so it's, I find it a very appealing part of the, the Australian character. And uh, so it's just a joy for me to go to work and and bring my uncles to life. It's, mm. it's, it's great. But he has a sad backstory too, doesn't he? His he's, personal he's, life well, that's right. has been very sad. Particularly when the series started, he was, um, he was down in the dumps. He was very curmudgeonly. He sick. lost his wife. Mm. He, he was sick and his two boys had been killed in the war. So he, he, he copped some batterings. Mm. But then when he's Sarah... Like a hermit, wasn't he? Almost he was almost a hermit. He yeah. was very much a recluse. Mm. He didn't like the doctor. Um, he didn't think much of you. Um, <laughs> but um, but n- then g- gradually Sarah's arrival in the town and into Roy's life slowly uh, brought out that humanity. So so m- my journey or the journey I've I've taken Roy on with with you know um, using the scripts as a basis is uh, to bring Roy back to who he was before all those tragedies occurred to him yeah so he was he is a bit of a he's a character in the town he um now as it turns out he's the one relied upon to mc the talent quests or uh you know the electioneering campaigns he's which is what he was this is my imagination that's what he was before all those tragedies mm. occurred to him mm. but he's, he's uh, a joy to play and i must say bevan and the writers uh, bring a wonderful rhythm 
to Roy's dialogue and speech, and uh, and I'm I've been and I I'm pleasantly surprised that, that they do do it uh, because I know a bit about it. As I say, I've lived I've lived with these people, and I know how they speak and the and the patterns and uh, and uh, the, the the script writers generally do a great job. But obviously, we do have we do have the uh, ability to. Uh, Tweak it if we if we so desire. Can I so, just ask? Has uh, Roy secretly got married? Because we noticed in season five we've had a preview. Yeah, season five, episode two, there was a reference. Shh, to... Don't you dare tell anybody. Go okay, ahead. we won't tell anyone. Okay. It's just there's no, no reference. Everybody, to it, ev everybody's going to know about it. But that's all right. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, there's a reference well, to it, but there wasn't a reference to it. So we were just like, hmm. Well, Doris certainly thought that there was an imminent marriage, didn't she, in season oh, four? Oh, we liked the way you talked to Doris and she understood. Yeah. It was yes. a really nice... Was um, Frankie, um, does well, Love... Does... I, I don't think Roy has... Um, I don't think Roy's laying with a woman, to use a term, for possibly... Many a year. Well, it'll be, it'll be, probably now it'll be coming on to 10 or 12 years. So, so what has he laying with? <laughs> <laughs> Lucky, he's been lame with Lucky. Lucky's been keeping his bed warm yeah. to cuddle in. That's what it was. Well, just keep this nice, okay? <laughs> just to talk to friends, okay? okay. Uh, so there is, well, there's no spoilers. It's about time, I'll just say this it, it may be time for romance to come back into Roy's life. I'll just say it. Well, Elizabeth's is, been lucky, so Roy deserves to be lucky too, doesn't he? Yeah. 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 Um, without telling us uh, too much, because in the States we have not seen it yet, um, does love soften Roy, uh, Roy at all? Are we going to see something, a new side of him? Oh, yes. Uh, well, uh, you know, if Roy was to fall in love, and uh, then obviously it would, it, would, it would soften him because it softens everyone, doesn't it? So yes, uh, if if that happens, which I'm not at liberty to say, but I don't think it would change him that much. No, no, no. He's, but it would bring out other aspects of his uh, of his personality, yeah. um, and probably make him even more warm. And uh, because even though he's, um, you know, I, I, you know, when when you're portraying these characters, you want to make them as rounded as you possibly can. You want to make them as human as you possibly can. So you want to, you know, within the limits of the characters and the scripts, and uh, you, you need to be able to show all aspects of your character as a as a rounded human being. I believe, anyway. He might get a good set of glasses instead of jam <laughs> jars. <laughs> <laughs> no, jam jars definitely go for. A... <laughs> yeah, they'll come back into fashion, and she wearing. Already are. Yeah, already are. Yeah. Well, um, that was something. Right, that was there's an example. That was something that I knew from my father, mm -hmm. uh, not my, 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 my grandfather. And I asked the props department, you know, if they could find me some, and, and of course they they love it. And I, I must say, you know, we are blessed in that aspect of of the production, aren't mm, we? Totally. The uh, the art department, the props, uh, they leave it, it's it's full of detail and mm. full of authenticity. And they they take great pride in their work, and they and that's why it's obviously appealed to an yeah, international audience to the extent it's, 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 it's recreated. Yeah, it's great. It's really great. Uh, Kathy and David, say hi. Hello. Hello. Oh, where are you guys? Near your poon. Do you know your poon? Your poon. Yes, yes, of course. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. You're from Queensland. We'll speak yeah. slower. <laughs> okay. um, uh, Kathy, Kathy was one of the first um, people to become a member of our group and she really introduced me she sent me a few very long emails with some beautiful beautiful pictures and really was the first one who introduced me to the physical beauty of uh, Australia and she's been a super fan since uh, since the beginning so uh, go ahead Kathy what would you what's what's on your mind Beautiful 
Yes, I do. Beautiful area there. It yes. is indeed. Yes, yes. yes. Tambourine yes. Mountain is my home. Yes, that's right. It's gorgeous. Uh, we know that um, season five jumps ahead four years. Um, without, uh, uh, we, we don't like spoilers because it ruins all the fun. But can you tell us a little bit about how the climate of the country has changed? And how, are we going to see um, the characters progress with the times? Uh, is Elizabeth going to be, you know, still caught up in her old ways? Um, is has How has the time and love changed uh, Elizabeth? Well, one, I think one of the most significant things that happens between 54 and 58 is the coming of television in 1956. And we had the Olympic Games in Melbourne in 1956. And so for the first time, we are getting an American influence in this country, mm. uh, as opposed to the British influence, mm. um, the very first time. So we're starting to get American television shows and American movies. American movies were there. Um, the American soldiers during the Second World War were the first kind of influx of, of American culture. But it, it, began, it began to be an everyday thing. So you've got rock and roll, you've got all these different influences. Mm. And the war is receding in the younger generation's minds. Mm. Um, it's now 13 years since the end of the Second World War. So we have a whole generation of young people who have not had any experience of the war. Um, they might have had an uncle who died or a grandpa who was there, but it's not such a, an active part of life. So certainly um, for people like Elizabeth, it's still very much in her mind um, and now that she's married to Douglas, who runs a refuge for returned soldiers, that's one of her major preoccupations. She, she lives in Sydney at the beginning of the, the season um, with Douglas, and, and they're very active in, in helping those returned servicemen, many of whom were utterly traumatised, as a lot of returned servicemen are. This, this is before there was such a thing as post-traumatic stress disorder. You just had people who were completely freaked out and... Um, antisocial or whatever and so she has poured a lot of her energy in, into helping these people um, recuperate to, to give them some comfort and some support um, particularly now that the family the family is off doing their own thing George is still a politician when we you know when we start in 1958 um, Abby who plays um, my granddaughter Anna, Anna. yeah thank you um, Abby is, is much, Anna, sorry, is much older um, in, in her head. She's a, an accomplished writer. Um, Jack and Carolyn uh, are living at Ash Park. Um, Carolyn has been married to Jack for all these years, five years or so. Did you see the gradual loosening up of the, of the uh, attitudes towards morals as well, don't yes, you? So yes. in that period, as you, if you'd be aware, um, Things like women's lib were starting to come about and women's sexuality was uh, being recognised. Uh, so you see that and you see the rise of youth culture uh, mm. and youth uh, rebellion. There's some of that. And there's also an, an interesting, well, I think I can say this, there's a character comes into town who's an Aboriginal guy played by a wonderful uh, Australian actor called Aaron Peterson. And... So, and that's another, another element of, uh, of Australia that uh, prior to that hasn't been addressed in the, in the show. So, yeah. so that's an interesting story, how everyone reacts to that, even uh, uh, the, the, so the, the elements of that racism, again, that inherent, uh, or I won't say, uh, racism is too strong a word. Well, we had a white Australia policy. We did have a white Australia policy. And the yeah. 60s. So, um, I mean, I hadn't, well, I grew up in Melbourne and mo most people who lived in capital cities in Australia didn't ever get to see an Indigenous person. No, that's true. You know, and they, most they people still around. haven't. No, they weren't around. Unless they go on an Outback Spirit tour. Yeah. Did I tell you about that? Are you on commission? Frank, are you on commission over there? Yeah. A, a com this is a commercial. Uh, so, but so, the most important thing, yeah. girls, is of course you've got a whole new range of fashion. 
Yeah. And cars. Cars and fashion and how people look and it's it's again it's fabulous the way mm. they've captured that. But, but oh, Australia is really amazing. Um, yeah, they are. They're, they're, they're funnily uh, enough, Roy, four years have gone by, but Roy's still wearing the same gear. Isn't that funny? <laughs> <laughs> He's still got the same shirts and pants that he had four years previously. Roy will never oh. go out of fashion though. <laughs> That's right. the thing. Uh, Frankie, your truck is, I see you haven't gotten a new one yet either, um, that's a character uh, uh, of its own, you know, the cars are a big, big part, of, and I'm always, uh, we have a member who's a classic car fanatic, and I'm always uh, sending him a picture and saying, uh, can you identify this car, I'd never heard of a Holden before, but um, do you uh, tell us about the mechanics of it when we see a lot of driving um, and by the way I hope Norman has found another job because I see that uh, Elizabeth no longer has a chauffeur uh, but the the fashion and the uh, cars and the horses uh, play an important role uh, you know, contribute greatly. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, how they play into your characters? Okay, well, I can tell you that the truck that Roy drives is the same truck that Hugh Jackman's character drove <gasps> in the movie Australia. <gasps> uh, have you seen that movie? Of course, yeah. multiple times. <laughs> well, it's the same truck, and I'll tell you something else, which I think is, is quite ironic. Once I, so I'm driving the same truck that Hugh Jackman drove, you know, I get a little kick out of that. <laughs> and then once I was in the wardrobe department trying on shirts, and they gave me a shirt that Hugh Jackman wore Goodness. in the movie Australia. Well, you know what? I couldn't get over my chest and shoulders. <laughs> what a pussy! Hugh Jackman! <laughs> like he wouldn't be really hard to accolade, Roy, that's why. <laughs> Oh, dear. Some shoulders, you. You know, I'm so beef up, man. <laughs> but it is, it is a bugger. It is a bugger of a thing. I'll tell you that truck. It's it's not easy to drive. Yeah. And at one point, Marta and I, that they they there was a issue with the exhaust. So the exhaust fumes were coming up through the floor of the truck into the cabin, and you know, uh, exhaust fumes are very very dangerous. Mm. And we had to, we're doing this scene one day down at uh, Camden. It was a really hot day, and we, uh, not Marta and I fault, but just technical issues. We had to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And I actually thought we were going to pass out until I had to say, stop. I don't want to seem like a, a wuss, but we, we cannot work with this truck anymore until it gets fixed. And of course, everyone goes, oh, bloody Nambi Pamby actors, until <laughs> you know, a couple of them came over. I went, oh, jeez, that, you know, that is dangerous. Yeah. So it is, um, it's a temperamental, it's a temperamental beast, the truck. They're very hard to drive, these these vehicles. And I, I remember when I first got my, my car, was it a Bentley? I don't know, cars. My, my, yeah. yeah. And there was a, a scene that described Elizabeth um, alights from her vehicle regally. And <laughs> this very early on in the show. And people must have been much shorter or something. I don't know. Yes, but, they were. But I had a big fur coat and a... And a stupid big hat and gloves and a handbag and every other thing. And I tried to get in and out of this car. I looked, I had to double, bend double. I looked like a cockroach on its back. So in the end, they couldn't film me getting out of the car. They had to cut away because there was no way you could get out of the car gracefully. It just wasn't going to happen. No, and it's very, it's very difficult. Very difficult. It, it, it's very difficult to do anything like stand up regally mm. when, when, when you make that standing up noise. That, <laughs> but even the steering wheel, the steering wheel used to cut into Norman's lap. Yes. You know, yeah. they're, they're not like we're used to today, that's for sure. They look great, but they're not as, not as comfortable. Yeah, they are. They're Frankie, definitely a uh, Frankie, what kind of car do you drive in real life? Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> my name is Frankie J. Holden. Yes. The initial letter, F. J. Holden. Holden is a famous car in Australia, um, and the FJ Holden is an iconic model in Australia. And in fact, Dr. Jack drove an FJ Holden in the first 
two or three seasons uh, of a place to call home. So I and I do have one. I do have an F.K. Holden, just like Dr. Jack's. It's the same colour, in fact. Uh, it's called Olympic Green because it was released in the 1956 uh, Olympics. And I also have a, a 1966 model, HR Holden, uh, and I, that's a, I've got a 1966 because that's the same year of birth as my wife. And, and then I drive a, you know, a current model Commodore uh, wagon, which is just a, it's like a town car, you know. It's also uh, a Holden. It, it's a Holden as well, but it's a, it's a family wagon, you know. So I have right. the family wagon, which is just a, a very comfortable car. It's, it's a good car. And then I have these two older vehicles, which I keep as, as toys, but I do use them. It's mm. been very sad for Holden this week to hear that they've stopped making them in Australia now, yeah. considering they're such classic cars and they'll always be Aussie to us. It's, it's like end yeah. of an era. So it's good to know that you're keeping hold of them. Yes, very much so. It's, uh, and I've had to do a couple of interviews um, I was on 60 Minutes and I was on the ABC um, because of my name, etc. They're asking me for my feelings about that. And it is the end of an era and, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's representing a, a technological change um, where we just cannot manuf you know, manufacturing uh, in its death throes in this country, as I think it is in a lot of other countries around the world. Yeah. And but, so there's that aspect of it which is a tragedy for the people who have lost their jobs, mm. but there's a romantic aspect of it, where this uh, wonderful brand, Australian brand, and it meant so much to Australians to be able to make their own cars mm. back in the day, and it's, and it's no more. But, um, you know... You're going to you change put? your name to FJ Hyundai. <laughs> <laughs> Harold Hyundai. Harold, Harold Hyundai. What do you drive, Mooney? I've got a Hyundai. <laughs> <laughs> so have I. It's a black thing. That's all I know. I, they all cars all look the same to me, apart from the old, you know, the beautiful old cars with marvelous design. But modern cars, I couldn't tell one from another. Well, that was another thing I, I brought up when I did one of these interviews. Is that um, it's and it's great, you know, seeing these old vehicles in uh, a place to call home because it's another element of contemporary life that's just being homogenised. Mm. All the cars Looks are starting to look the same. Yep. And soon we're going to have driverless cars, and they, guess what? They're, they're going to be punched out of the same factory, somewhere in China probably, mm. and they're all going to look the same, and we're going to lose another element of design and beauty and form and line. Mm. Same as architecture. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, Yes. Noni, I promised I would ask this question. Um, uh, somebody wants to know, I can't remember, I'm sorry who asked, but they wanted to know, do you really have a rose garden? Do you play piano at home? And do you really knit? Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, um, I don't have many roses in my garden because I'm not there enough to tend them, but there are some roses. Uh, I do play the piano at home and... Um, much more successfully than I play on the show because all the, the pianos in the show are actually unplayable. They're so old, they can't be tuned properly. So they give me this music to learn and I practice and practice and practice. And then I get there and it just sounds like I'm playing with my elbows. So <laughs> there's one really funny scene for poor Robert who plays Douglas who had to gaze loving, lovingly at me while I played to him um, on the piano that's in front of the big mural wall at Ash Park. And it, it's, it really is unplayable, but he had to look at me while I was playing it. Honestly, it just sounded like seven spiders had been let loose on their keyboard. It was pathetic. But I will say that uh, it's obvious to me that you can play the piano. Yeah, okay. Because, and it's a thing, it's a bugbear of mine. Yeah. If I see a person, an actor, you know, and the, the role calls for them to play the piano or the guitar or yeah. the drums, and it's obvious that they, they can't. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. And I knit. I love knitting too. Yeah, knitting is a great pastime. Uh, excellent. All right, but we're going to wind down, but just uh, two, two quick questions. Um, what can we look forward to? Don't tell us, you know, we don't want any spoilers again, but tell us a little bit more about what we can expect in Season 5. And then... 
the international audience talk to them a little bit? Yeah. Well, what I'd love the international audience to know is that we are so thrilled that our show works for you because, you know, in Australia we are a long way from everywhere. And to get the kind of feedback that we get through through Susan and her fellow administrators and through all of you, you know, I, I check Facebook daily. I'm, I'm often putting things on there, but it just does us so much good to know that what we're doing means something to people everywhere because a great story is a great story mm. and, and human beings share more similarities than differences. And... I think I've expressed this in, in posts before, you know, that in these times when we're being constantly separated from one another and us versus them, it's just so lovely to know that we're creating a, a family, really, and it does feel like a family all over the world. We feel we have these friends that we can talk to about stuff all over the world. And the themes that we raise are, are in the show are themes that clearly resonate all around the world mm. and and to get that kind of feedback to know that we're, we're telling stories that make people think and feel and that move them and and inspire them or cause them to reflect or discuss things with each other as opposed to just pressing buttons that gives us such joy and and it really helps to to make you know the six months a year when we don't have work um, <laughs> They're bearable, so we're very grateful. But in terms of what you can expect, um, you can expect much more complexity in a way. Um, that it has the same kind of thriller elements that it's always had. There, there is some tragedy and there, there is a lot of joy. Um, we have small children in season five, obviously. That's not a spoiler because there were babies at the, the end of season four and now they're they have personalities and they have um, presence uh, and they, they bring another element to the program entirely. Um, but I, I just hope that, you know, you will respond in the way that you have. And I think you will because there's so much in there. We, we were very pleased with the, the standard of the scripts. For season yeah, many, five. many of the, the, the themes are universal yeah. um, uh, and uh, apply to any society. Um, and then when you add that, add into that the fact that it's set in Australia, and which I know is interesting, and it's well, it's interesting to us looking back in time, and I think that's part of the reason for the success of the show. But it, yeah, I uh, agree with Nani one hundred percent. To uh, well, there I was, as we've said, uh, in the middle of nowhere, I get a phone call, and now here we are, six years later, yeah, talking to people on the other side of the earth, yeah. Um, and that's just wonderful and something to be very, very grateful for, and, and, and we are. Yeah, incredibly so. <laughs> well, I, w I want to say, um, you know, I know, uh, Noni and Frankie, you know that uh, <clears throat> I come from the world of show business, and my career in Hollywood started at the heyday of Dynasty and Falcon Crest and <clears throat> all these shows which are now being – Dynasty has been resurrected – um, because they couldn't have, they couldn't come up with um, anything new, and I think part of the reason that your show is so popular is because it is new and different, and <clears throat> you take a period piece that's relevant today. Um, our group talks about it, we have deep discussions about the Holocaust and about PTSD and about homosexuality. Uh, lots of talk. I know you have a, a vote coming up um, that uh, for marriage equality and there's been lots of discussion about it. Not all of it positive, but it keeps the discussion um, going. Um, one more thing. Just talk about the wonderful dear Bevan Lee. <laughs> Well, Bevan is an icon uh, of Australian television drama. He's been behind so many wildly successful uh, television dramas and uh, he's he confessed this to us at the start, that he felt that he was bringing all of his experience, all of his skills uh, to bear into this show. And, uh, and it's a labour of love for him. And, and, and I think that shows, every time we sit down and read the scripts for the first time, uh, we spontaneously talk. And I, I will honestly say this, you know, uh, 
coming up to six seasons, when we get together and do the read-throughs, every page, I'm still going, oh, my God, really? And they turn over, oh! <laughs> and it's, I, it's, I, it's a joy. It's a joy to read, and then it's a joy to bring it bring it to life on the screen. And he's, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's just been a wonderful, what's the word, vehicle for projecting Australian lives and values onto the screen over so many, many years. Mm. Yeah. And, and also, he doesn't like you. Know. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, but also, I, I think it's, I asked him very early on, why did you write this? Because I knew, you know, we were going to get interviewed about it and I needed something to hang, a, hang it from. And he said, I wanted to talk about bigotry and intolerance. And we, we learn less and less history about ourselves each year. Kids are learning less and less mm. history about their own countries and their own mm. cultures as we do become homogenised, as we mentioned before. And so I think it's really, it, how do you stop wars if you don't know what started them before? Mm. You know, how do you, how do you learn from the past if you don't know what happened in the past? And that's why Elizabeth resonates for me because she was all about secrets in the beginning. She was mm. all about keeping things hidden. And, and I've just been on a, a, been lucky enough to do an episode of Who Do You Think You Are for Australian television. I look and forward to that one. Well, thank you. My mum was very secretive and the things I learned, I wished she had told me because we would have had a very different relationship. Mm. Yep, know that one. So, so I think that's something that I think is a great theme of this show too, that secrets hurt and cause damage. Um, and and not knowing about the past is not a good thing. I think it's particularly, you know, we live at terrible times, uh, particularly in the United States where every day there's a, a, something new that divides us further. And uh, so being able to watch A Place to Call Home where we see people really evolve going from the bigotry and the intolerance to acceptance, it's, a, it's a, just a wonderful, wonderful message. Um, I want to thank you guys. Uh, you've been terrific. Um, keep in touch. Frankie, let us know about this theater and what's going on. And when you play with that fabulous band of yours, uh, the fans are just thirsty for everything. And Noni, uh, you know how we all feel about you. Your continued participation and interaction with us is you are so responsible for so much of the warm feeling and the connection. I'm, I don't know how many thousand, 10,000 miles away from you. And I feel like I'm sitting in your living room and, you know, having some of that nice Australian wine. And um, uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. We're going to post David, who is our very able technical advisor, is sitting quietly there uh, with, okay. with, um, with, with Kathy is going to, post this so that the members can get get a, a chance to know you a little bit more. Uh, we look forward with great excitement to the new season and uh, keep those cards and letters coming. I mean, yeah, and, and keep the feedback coming because we find it fascinating. We love seeing, particularly when you try and work out what's going to happen. We love that. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Be well. Um, Noni, have a great uh, great time. I'm sure you're going to have a terrific, terrific audience. And Frankie, um, now you can, you know, we're big on hyphenates in show business here. So now you are actor, musician, producer, oh. and theater, and th theater patron. We're going to, okay. I'm going to... I'm going to go to Wikipedia right now and add that. Okay. Thank you for organizing this, Susan. God bless everybody. Thank you so My much. Pleasure. Bye, Thank guys. You. Stay well. All okay. the Bye. Break a leg. Bye. Bye-bye.